the Comic Weekly Man, the jolly Comic Weekly Man, and I'm here to read the funnies to you happy boys and honeys. Yes, boys and girls, it's Comic Weekly time, and here I come right into your house to bring a little fun and happiness. Right out of the pages of Puck the Comic Weekly, straight into your living room, your friend, the Comic Weekly Man, the jolly Comic Weekly Man. Hello, hello, hello. Hello, hello, hello. Well, little Miss Honey, how are you today? Oh, I'm just fine, thank you. But I'm very anxious today. Well, who are you anxious about now? I'm very anxious about Rusty Rally because you remember last week, Rusty Rally was to go live with a nice old lady on a farm. But when he got there, he found out that there was a younger woman who was pretending to be an old lady. That's right. And I'm wondering, is this young lady who's pretending to be the old lady a crook? And is the man named Mel who was with her there planning to do something terrible to Rusty? Or will Rusty find out that something is wrong and escape before anything bad can happen to him? Well, you really are anxious, aren't you? Yes. So could we please read the funny? Fuck the comic weekly? Yes. Very well, I'll read that in just a moment. But before I do, let's listen to this nice man. Now here we go with Puck the Comic Weekly, and on the first page, under Bringing Up Father, Beetle Bailey. Magic words for the music, please. Very well, my lady. <whistles> toot me a toot and tweet me a tweedle. Squeeze out music for Bailey the Beetle. <whistles> Outside on the parade grounds, the soldiers are busy marching up and down, practicing their maneuvers. But Beetle has got into trouble again. And he's been sent to the kitchen to do kitchen police. And today we find him and his friend, Carrot, busy peeling potatoes. Beetle sighs. Uh, I wish they gave medals for being on KP. Carrot answers. Hey, by golly, you really deserve one. Carrot stands up and snaps to attention. He holds out a leaf of a tree. Private Bailey, I am proud to present you with this oak leaf cluster. Hey, who are you supposed to be? At that moment, a butterfly lands on Carrot's shoulder. I'm a butterfly colonel. Whereupon Beetle joins the game, snaps to attention, looks at the potatoes, and says, Troops and Sean, the colonel is ready to inspect. Then Beetle holds up one potato and shouts, Eyes front. Last picture top row, Carrot, pretending to be an officer inspecting his troops, marches up and down in front of the potato sacks. Hmm, a pretty baggy looking bunch you have here. First picture, bottom row, Beetle shouts. Attention to orders! The uniform today will be jackets. I have spoken. By this time, Carrot, thoroughly carried away, shouts, Fashing with you! Beetle sticks his hand in his jacket and stands like Napoleon. At that moment, the sergeant, who has heard the shouting, approaches. Okay, okay, you guys, pipe down and get back to work. Whereupon, Carrot grabs the sergeant's tie and roars back. What's this? Insubordination? And the sergeant goes... What? And last picture. Beetle and Carrot are beside a stack of potatoes twice as high, and they peel away and peel away. Beetle looks at all the potatoes and sighs... Uh, it was insubordination, all right. And Carrot apologizes. Uh, I got carried away. <laughs> oh, that was funny. The way they pretended to be officers and pretended the potatoes were soldiers. Yeah. <laughs> and Carrot got carried away when the sergeant came up and he grabbed his tie and yelled, What's this? Insubordination? Yes, insubordination. And he was the one who was guilty of it. <laughs> that was very funny. <laughs> well, what's insubordination? Well, insubordination is when somebody rises up against the authorities who are over him. Oh, then Carrot did a terrible thing. Oh, yes, something that'll cause him a lot of trouble. Well, now let's see what Donald Duck is doing today, Oh, huh? yes, because I just love Donald. Very well, then, let's turn over the page, go past little iodine... Past Prince Val, who's on page three and who's making a trip into dangerous territory today. Turn over that page, and here we are on page four with Donald Duck. Say the magic words with me. 
Squeeze em, squeeze em, squid and chicka jack. That's our music, the better quack quack. It's three o'clock in the morning, and Donald is sound asleep. He snores away when all of a sudden his alarm clock rings. And his nephew, Dewey, trots into Donald's room, shakes Uncle Donald. Hey, wake up, Uncle Donald. This is the day we're going hunting. And Donald wakes up, climbs out of bed, and second picture picks up a sheet of paper with a schedule written on it. And he says to his three nephews who are lined up before him, Okay, synchronize your watches. Okay, it's 3 a.m. Now first... Get dressed. And a few minutes later, third picture top row, the nephews dressed in their hunting clothes stand in front of Donald, who checks his schedule. Okay, boys, report in. Dewey says, I have the gun and ammunition. Check. Last picture top row, Huey says, And I have the blankets and the hot water bottles. Check. First picture bottom row, Louie says, And I have the coffee and the food. Okay, let's go. Half hour later, they're buzzing along a country road. Dewey looks at his watch. We're one minute and six seconds behind schedule, Uncle Donald. Don't worry. We'll be on the lake and ready to blast by shooting time. Fifteen minutes later, they're on the lake, rowing to the spot where they're going to do their shooting. Dewey looks at his watch again. Ten minutes to sunrise, Uncle Donald. Don't worry. We'll make it. Finally, the boat comes to a stop. Donald looks at his watch. Ah, we made it. Three minutes to sunrise and shooting time. Drop anchor. They drop the anchor. Now, we'll wait for the ducks to come in. And boy, oh boy, we'll blast them. Fifteen minutes later, the sun is almost up. The ducks fly in, but instead of blasting away, Donald and his nephews are sound asleep, and they snore, and the wild ducks go. <laughs> oh, what a good joke on Donald. <laughs> yes, after all that preparation, working out the schedule and everything, he and his nephews are so tired that they sound asleep. <laughs> and in come the ducks and fly around and quack, quack, and still Donald's feet. Some hunter. <laughs> yes, some hunter. Well, now look across the page. Oh, there's Peter Pan. Yes, Peter Pan. And last week, Peter and Captain Hook were fighting on the edge of a cliff. And Captain Hook's foot slipped and he fell over the cliff. But his hook caught in a rock, and there he hung in the air. And then the crocodile that wants to eat Captain Hook came up out of the water, and that scared Captain Hook. I wonder if Captain Hook will fall in the crocodile's mouth and be gobbled up. Well, let's read now and find out. Here we go with Peter Pan. Say the magic words with me. Pirates, Pirates crocodiles, crocodiles, Peter Pan, Pan, Pan. Whisk up music for Never Never Land. As the crocodile who has swallowed the alarm clock opens his mouth, Hook hears the menacing sound. He looks down and shrieks, No, 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 no! And then his hook gives way, and he falls toward the open mouth of the crocodile. No, no, no! And the two plunge in the water below. They disappear from sight. Peter and Wendy wonder what's going on in the water below. And then the crocodile's head appears again. And there, third picture top row, is Captain Hook, his arms and legs wrapped around the crocodile's mouth, holding it closed. Smee, the captain's man, rows toward him and shouts, Stay right where you are, Captain. I'll save you. At that moment, the crocodile makes a super crocodile effort, pulls his jaws open, and sends Hook flying in the air. No! As Hook comes flying down, Oh, no, 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 no. The crocodile snaps his jaws shut on Hook's cocktails. Hook leaps for the boat. Quick, Captain. Lands in the boat. Roll for the ship, Smee. Roll for the ship. Smee rolls for the ship with a crocodile in hot pursuit. And as they disappear, Peter laughs. 
<laughs> uh, the codfish got away. And then suddenly, Wendy exclaims, Peter, what about Tiger Lily? Peter looks around at Tiger Lily, the Indian chief's daughter, whom Hook had left on a rock in the water. He sees the tide is coming in, and now the water is up around Tiger Lily's throat. Peter dives for her. Hey, Tiger Lily! Oh, Tiger Lily! Oh, I wonder if Peter will get to Tiger Lily in time. After all, she's bound by those ropes that Captain Hook tied around her. Well, let's hope he makes it. I'm sure he will. Yes, but Tiger Lily is very heavy, and, and Peter is just a boy. Can he carry us through the air? Well, we'll find out about that next week. And maybe we'll see whether Captain Hook made his escape from the crocodile. Now let's turn over the page. Now look, on page seven, there's Flash Gordon. Oh, yes, Flash Gordon. And you remember that Flash is on the moon where he had to land when he had trouble with his rocket ship. Yes, and there he found a beautiful woman named Dr. Stella and her assistant, a man named Mark. Yes, but they were crooks, and they caused Flash a lot of trouble. And Flash discovered last week that Mark had taken off in Flash's rocket ship and was trying to overtake a rocket ship from Earth that was carrying a valuable load of freight. And Mark was going to try to rob that ship. Yes, and then Flash would be blamed for it because it was Flash's ship that Mark was using. I wonder if he got away with it. Well, let's read now and find out. Here we go with Flash Gordon. rega dega doon doon saskimatash Let's have music for Heroic Flash. <laughs> From their lair behind the moon, the space bandits, Mark and Dr. Stella, use Flash's stolen rocket to hijack a richly laden freighter from Earth. Pulling alongside the cargo craft, Mark orders it to land. When his command is ignored, the ruthless space pirate launches a guided missile at his quarry. There's a terrific roar as the shot strikes home in the crew's headquarters. Back at the moon station, Flash swiftly takes advantage of the opportunity offered by Mark's absence. From a locker, Flash takes three space suits, and as he and his friends, Dale and Zarkov, down them, he explains. Now listen, we're up against overwhelming numbers, but I have a scheme. Flash's plan is simple but dangerous. With his rocket pistol, he blasts open a viewport. The pressurized air pours out of the station into empty space. The pirate guards, realizing their air has escaped, become panicky. They know they can't live without air. Some of them frantically try to put on spacesuits. Others vainly struggle to seal the leaking viewport. First picture, bottom row, before the stunned space outlaws know what's happened to them. Flash brushes past them and forces open the hatch that leads to the sealed underground laboratory. A sudden onrush of air proves that someone is inside, keeping up emergency pressure in this last-ditch hideout. A glance shows Flash that the sole occupant of the laboratory is the pirate queen, Stella. Huddled in a corner, weak from the sudden loss of air, she summons her waning strength to fire her blast gun as Flash's form is silhouetted in the hatchway. But her aim is unsteady and the shot goes wild. Last picture, Flash picks up the suffocating queen. Dale arrives on the scene. Flash orders, quick, tell Zarkov to stand guard. I'll take Stella into the airlock. Unless she gets oxygen in a hurry, she's doomed. Oh, hooray, goody. Flash has captured Dr. Stella, and now he's the boss. Yes, it looks like he is. He's unconscious, and at the moment, Flash is the boss. That was smart of him to think of putting his space suit on and then let the air out of the room. Yes, because his suit manufactures oxygen so he can breathe. Yes, but the others can't when they don't have their space suits on, can no, they? No, they can't. Well, I wonder if Flash will capture Mark and the others when they return to the rocket ship. Well, that's something we'll find out next week. Now let's turn over the page and see who's there. All right. Oh, look, there's Dick's Adventures on the last page of the first section. And I'll read that in just a moment. But first, here's that nice man again with something interesting to say. Now, here we go again with Puck the Comic Weekly. And on the last page of the first section, Dick's Adventure. Magic words for the music, please. Say them with me, please. Riggity pack a zack a zick. Let's have music for adventure to stick. Dick is dreaming that he's in the early days of America, in the territory of Texas. At this time, Texas still belonged to Mexico. Dick is with his friend Jim Bowie, who has been working to secure Texas freedom from Mexico. 
He and Dick have been pursued by Mexican soldiers. When their escape was cut off, they dashed into the old city hall and made their way to the bell tower. But they're only safe there for a short time before they hear the sound of a battering ram below. When Dick looks over the edge of the tower, he sees the Mexican soldiers with a huge timber battering against the door. And then the door gives way and the soldiers burst in. Last picture, second row, the soldiers search in the half darkness of the building, looking for the two Texas rebels. And then one of them sees the stairway. And in a second, the soldiers are heading for the tower. First picture, second row, Dick, who is looking down the stairs, exclaims, Jim, they're coming up! For a second, it looks as if Jim and Dick are trapped. But then suddenly, Jim exclaims, Hey, Dick, the bell! And he springs to the cradle on which the bell hangs. But quick, Dick, pull! Let's rip it loose! Desperation gives them strength. With all their might, they lift. And the bell slips off its frame. For a second, it is poised on the edge of the staircase. Already, the soldiers are swarming up. Bowie shouts, Here we are! We're coming down! And he gives the bell a push. And it roars down the staircase onto the soldiers below. First picture, third row, the fantastic weapon clangs down in terrifying destruction, knocking the soldiers down like ten pins. And then a second later, a rope appears from the bell tower. And in the confusion, Dick and Jim Bowie, last picture, slide down the rope. Why, come on, Dick, fast. And Jim and Dick make their escape. You bet it was, using the bell the way they did, rolling it down the soldiers. Yes, it just knocked them down like it was a bowling ball. It was a lucky thing that rope was there for Dick and Jim to slide down. Yes, but I'm afraid they'll be in more trouble with the Mexicans. Yes, so am I. We'll have to wait until next week to find that out. Now look below Dick's adventures. There's Rusty Riley. Oh, yes, and I'm anxious to see what happens to him because Rusty has come to Denver Dooley's farm, you remember? Yes, Rusty's to have a job on the farm taking care of Dooley's horses. And he's supposed to live with Dooley's sister. Yes, and Mr. Dooley said that she was an old lady. But instead, when Rusty got out to the farm, he found a young lady who was pretending to be old. And also, there was a man there who was pretending to be the hired man. But I know he's not the hired man. He's up to some crooked scheme, and he's planning something against Rusty. I wonder what this is all about. Well, let's read now and see if we can see what this is all about. Here we go with Rusty Riley. Gallop and run till the road is dusty. Give us music for his horse and Rusty. Rusty's been taken to his room by the lady downstairs. And he says to himself, It sure is a nice place to live. Miss Dooley's real swell, but Mr. Dooley said she was his older sister. And the man at the station said she was a nice old lady, but... Gee, Miss Dooley looks young enough to be Mr. Dooley's daughter. And then he tries the radio, but it doesn't work. He thinks the antenna needs fixing, so he tries to get on the roof by way of the attic. But fourth picture top row, he finds the door to the attic locked. Golly, it's a big heavy lock on this door. I guess they must keep a lot of valuable stuff up in the attic. Last picture top row, he says to himself, Oh, well, I'll ask Miss Dooley later if I can go up there. Right now, I'll go look at the horses I'm supposed to take care of. First picture, bottom row, Rusty comes into the barn, takes one look at the horses, and exclaims, Sheepers, the poor things. They're in awful shape. He looks for feed right away. Hey, those poor horses are half starved. They haven't been brushed down in months. I hope I can find some oats. Oh, shucks, the feed bin's empty. Just then the barn door opens, and in comes Mel, the suspicious character who's pretending to be the hired man. Oh, hello, Mel. I was just going to look for you. The horses need feed. They're in awful bad shape. Isn't there any feed? Mel stammers, Well, they, uh, well, they've been sick. Uh, the feed man didn't show up and... Uh, uh, hey, wait here. I'll speak to tri- uh, Miss Julie. <laughs> Last picture, Mel is in the house talking to the girl who's pretending to be Miss Dooley. Hey, listen, Trixie, that kid knows too much about horses. They gotta have feed. He's likely to tell Dooley. We gotta spend a few bucks. Trixie answers, Oh, all right. No need to make any commotion of it. It's a way to get another check cashed. Oh, isn't it terrible the way the 
those two people are treating those horses? Yes, it is. You should never treat animals that way. Tie them up and then not bring them food or water? No, because the poor animals can't help themselves. I just hate people who are cruel to animals. I feel the same way. I wonder, I uh, wonder what happened to the real Miss Dooley. Well, maybe. I wonder if they're holding her prisoner someplace. Well, I... Do you suppose that Mel and Trixie are a couple of robbers who are hiding away there? Well, we'll find out more about that next week. Now it's time to go to the second section. Oh, yes, and here's Dagwood. <laughs> that funny, funny Dagwood. <laughs> yes, here's Dagwood on the first page of the second section of Puck the Comic Weekly. And here we go with Dagwood and Blondie. Ram a food, ram a fum, zim zam zombie. Conjure me music for Dagwood and Blondie. Blondie and her neighbor, Tootsie Woodley, are standing out by the back fence talking. I'm trying to figure out what to cook for supper tonight. Yes, it is a problem, isn't it? At that moment, Alexander rides his bicycle up to Dagwood, who's talking to Herb Woodley in front of the house. Hey, Pop, will you watch my bike for me while I change my clothes? Oh, sure, son. Moment later, last picture top row, Blondie and Tootsie are still talking about plans for supper. I can't give him chicken croquettes. He doesn't like that. Suddenly, Dagwood comes whizzing toward them on a bicycle. Hey, look! No hands! Don't look. He's just showing off. And Dagwood whizzes out of sight. <coughs> Blondie leans back against the fence, first picture, second row. It's too late to start a stew. Tootsie throws up her hands in resignation. Honestly, sometimes I think there's nothing left to cook. And then Herb comes whizzing toward them on the bicycle. He's standing on the seat on one foot, holding the other high in the air. Hey, look at this! The girls pay no attention to him, and Herb sails out of sight. First picture, third row, Blondie says... I wouldn't dare give Dagwood fish again. We've had it three nights in a row. Oh, yes, I forgot. Mr. Dithers gave you all those mackerel he caught on his fishing trip. And then the bicycle appears again. This time, Dagwood and Herb are both riding it. Dagwood is sitting backwards on the handlebars, and Herb is upside down, standing on his head on the seat. Yippee! Don't look. The girls turn their backs on the boys as the bicycle goes past. Boy, we should be in the circus! Last picture, third row, Blondie says... Let's see, what else is there? Chops, steak, spare ribs and sauerkraut. Frankfurt isn't being so nice for a change. When suddenly, there is a... Hey, what are you doing? Come on! Now. The girls dash around the corner. Second picture, bottom row, they see Herb and Dagwood lying on the ground under a fish cart. And they're surrounded by fish. And the fish peddler shouts, You'll pay me for every one of these fish or I call the police! And last picture, Herb and Dagwood, with their arms full of fish, are going up the walk, followed by Blondie and Tootsie. And Blondie says... Well, anyway, we know what we're going to have for supper. <laughs> <laughs> oh, those silly boys, showing off in front of the girls. Yes, I'm afraid their enthusiasm carried them too far. <laughs> yes, it carried them right into the fish cart. <laughs> and into another fish dinner. <laughs> yes. Well, let's turn over the page now and see who we find. Let's go past the Lone Ranger on page two. And there, on page three, under Snuffy Smith, is Roy Rogers. Oh, yes, and Roy Rogers. And you remember that Roy got into real trouble last week. Yes, the cattlemen are trying to drive some farmers named Trent out of the country. And the cattlemen rode to the Trent farm and shot their horses and cows and all the animals last week, you remember? Yes, and one of these cattlemen was dressed just like Scarecrow Katie, a nice old man. And so the Trents think that he is to blame for all their trouble, but he's not. No, he's not. But the Trents have been trying to catch Scarecrow Katie, and so far, Roy has prevented that. But last week in the fight with the Trents, Roy got knocked subconscious. I wonder what'll happen next. Yes, Roy was knocked unconscious. So let's see what happens. Here we go with Roy Rogers, king of the cowboys. A yip by yo now here we go with Roy and Trigger. A yip by yo. Hug Trent and his father stand over Roy's unconscious body. And then a man gallops up. Hey, Trent! Scarecrow Katie and his gang just raided your farm. Hurry, and we can pick up the trail. Quickly the Trents and their friends mount up. Roy, come on, Pug, let's go! As soon as the Trents have disappeared, Katie's daughter, Oriole, appears from out of the brush behind the building. She thanks Roy for helping her escape from the Trents. Roy gets to his feet 
Mount Trigger, last picture, top row. After I make sure you safely reach your father's hideaway, Miss Katie, I aim to find out why he's blamed for leading the war on the Valley Nesters. Meanwhile, first picture, bottom row, at a cabin on a nearby ranch. A man who is wearing clothes that look exactly like Scarecrow Katie is undressing. A cattleman enters. Hey, hide them clothes good, Snapper. We don't want somebody finding out you ain't the real Scarecrow, Katie. Oh, relax, Pete. Then Snapper takes a map out of his pocket, and pointing to it, he says, Soon as we run the trents out, we tear down their blasted fences so our steers can use their water hole. Savvy? Yeah, sure. And that poor old loco, Katie, hombre, gets the blame. Yeah, pretty slick. <laughs> A short time later, at Scarecrow Katie's hiding place, the sound of horse's hoops floats through the air to the old man's ears. Quickly, he unloosens a falcon, a bird he has trained for hunting. I hear somebody coming, black lady. If it's anybody but my daughter, don't let him reach you. Now fly. The bird flies off. Last picture, Roy and Oriole are riding up the trail toward Katie's hiding place. Suddenly, the bird swoops out of the air. Straight for Roy, it dies. The girl shrieks. Roy, watch out! That's Daddy's trained falcon. He'll claw your eyes out. Ooh, look at that bird. It's flying straight for Roy's face. Yes, and look at those sharp claws. Ooh, I wonder if Roy will be able to stop that bird from hurting Roy. Well, that's something I'm afraid we'll have to wait until next week to find out. Now, that's all the time I have. But before I go... Here's that nice fellow with some more interesting information. Well, honey, and all you boys and girls, I've got to go now. All right, Mr. Comic Bigly Man, but I'll be waiting for you next week. Okay, that's a date, and a date with all you boys and girls. Be sure to meet me with our little friend, Miss Honey, next week when I read Puck the Comic Weekly. For I'm the Comic Weekly Man, the jolly Comic Weekly Man. I'll be back to read the funnies to you happy boys and honeys. Don't forget, boys and girls, see you all next week. Your friend, the Comic Weekly Man, the jolly Comic Weekly Man.